Okay, hello. My name is John Cowan, or in full, John Voldemar Cowan. And there's a story behind that name, which I'll get to. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about identity, uh, specifically linguistic identity, since this is Wiki Tongues. I want to start by saying that I was born in New Jersey, but I've been living in New York for about 35 years. And that makes me something that isn't quite, I'm not quite New Jersey anymore, and I'm not quite New York. But if you listen to my speech pattern, which is the typical speech pattern of a, of a northeastern person outside the big cities who's an old fart like me, I'm 55 years old, then uh, you're going to hear something very like this. Uh, to me, Mary, Mary, and Mary all sound different and are all pronounced different. Uh, caught and caught don't sound anything alike. Uh, and I have, the only real exception I have to that is that I rhyme hurry and furry, which most people with my accent don't do. They say hurry, furry. They don't quite rhyme. Um, the, when I grew up in New Jersey, I was kind of an isolated kid. Uh, I was a brain. Uh, I was a nerd. I, I uh, didn't interact that much with people, so I tended to pick up my speech pattern from adults because I mostly hung around with adults. Um, my mother was a German immigrant. Uh, my father uh, was Irish American, but he grew up in the Irish ghetto in Philadelphia, which is south of South Street. It's still a ghetto, but not Irish. Um, everything that, uh, so a lot of what went into m the molding of my speech pattern came just as much from parents as peers. Now, for example, I don't talk with my mother's German accent, but some of the word choices that I'm using are probably influenced by her and by my father. My father had two accents. He could talk like a 19th century Irish American, which is, which is almost nothing like how Irish people talk in the 21st century. Uh, if you go to Ireland, you don't hear my father's accent. If you if you listen to what's called stage Irish, that's actually closer to it. I mean, stage Irish was invented in the 19th century, and it was an exaggeration of the way Irish Americans really talked in those days. So uh, he had two accents. That was one of them, and the other one was his Philadelphia accent, and he could switch back and forth between them. Or I should say his Falafia accent, because that's how they say Philadelphia and Falafia. <sighs> OK, so, um, so then I decided a, a, as soon as I became 18 or 19 that I was going to leave New Jersey, that I didn't want to continue living in the small town for a couple of reasons. Um, I was in a serious relationship and I wanted to move in with my girlfriend, which I did for a while. And then I went off to school and decided that was a bad idea. And I called her up and said, I'm leaving school. And she said, what? Why didn't you tell me? Why didn't you discuss this? And I said, discuss what? She said, well, obviously you're coming back to live with me. Don't you think I deserve to be told about it? I said, I'm sorry, but it never entered my mind. I was very clueless in those days. Anyway, we're, we're married. We're still together after 35 years. Just had our anniversary on Halloween. Um, so that was, uh, that was very nice. It worked out. I mean, we had, we had our struggles, but, uh, but it's, it's worked out extremely well. I have, a, uh, I have a daughter who's 26 who lives with me and a grandson who's five who lives with me. And the, he's the, especially he's the apple of my eye. I just adore him. Um, so uh, there are four different accents in my house. There's the accent, there's my wife's accent. She comes from North Carolina, but has been working very hard not to say umbrella and cement all the time. Uh, but she sticks to y'all because she thinks y'all is a great word, and I tend to agree. And she does say isn't it for isn't it. Okay, so, um, uh, but otherwise she thinks of her accent as there being something slightly wrong with it. On the other hand, uh, she does say Tuesday, and when I say Tuesday, she accuses me of being a gangster from Jersey, which is basically true. Now, um, that not being a gangster, but being from New Jersey. <laughs> so then my daughter, on the other hand, has a, was born in, in uh, New York City and, and has a New York City accent of her generation. Uh, she's an adopted child, um, so she, uh, she's, I'm, as you can see, white. Uh, my daughter is Hispanic. Uh, my grandson is black. At least those are the labels we put on them. I mean, you know, really it's kind of a skin color continuum, obviously. But even though my daughter doesn't have a word of Spanish because she was adopted from, uh, from the age of four weeks, she nevertheless very much thinks of herself as a Hispanic person. So, um, so she, has a, she has a New York City African-American influenced, you know, native dialect, uh, which sounds nothing like um, hers. Uh, my, uh, her mother's or mine. Um, her son, on the other hand, 
is, is in some way recreating my life. I mean, he's, he's now going to school, but he spent, the, he spent the first five years of his life not hanging out with other kids very much for one and another reason. And so he, he also talks a little bit like, in, like the people around him rather than his peer group, but I expect that to shift. As he gets older, you know, it'll be more important to him to sound like his friends than to sound like his parents and grandparents. So um, that's kind of my identity story. Um, I wanted to tell, I, I, wanted to, I wanted to tell two anecdotes. Um, one's about my mother. Um, my mother, actually two of them are about my mother. Maybe I'll tell three anecdotes. My, uh, my mother, um, came, as I said, came from Germany. She uh, moved to this country in, um, what was it now? 1932, and when you say that, everybody who, who, who knows any history says, oh, she, oh, you're Jewish? And my name is Cowan, but no, I'm not Jewish. Uh, Cowan is a, is, a, uh, is a Mac name, an Irish name, Mac Owen. And in fact, um, I'll get to that story. But when my mother came here, uh, she was 12 years old, and she was being brought over by her father because her mother had died, and she had been raised by the original horrible aunts from, from the Grimm's fairy tales. Um, and the, uh, I can say these things because all these people are dead. <laughs> so um, uh, she came here, and the first thing that happened was that she met, um, met uh, her father's new wife and his, his two new children. And the second thing that happened was that she found out that her stepmother was a manic depressive. And the third thing that happened was that in, in one of her depressive fits, her stepmother shot herself. So, it, um, and as soon as that happened, her father collapsed. You know, he just couldn't cope at all. Uh, the two little children, of course, couldn't do anything. So it was up to my mother, who had been in the United States for about, for about six months, to go downstairs and find the super and tell him, my mother has shot herself. But she had a problem. She couldn't remember, remember the past tense of shoot. And she knew there was an obscene word very close by, because in German, schießen is shoot and scheißen is shit. So she was running, down, running through the possibilities in her head as she went down the stairs to find the super. My mother has shooted herself? No. My mother has shitted herself? Out of the question. My mother has shat herself? No, 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 no. <laughs> so finally she got down to the bottom of the stairs, delivered the message, I don't know exactly how. <laughs> and uh, so the police were called and, the, and all the right things happened after that. Um, I mean, eventually, eventually my grandfather remarried, there were more children. Um, you know, she got over it. Uh, another thing that, that happened to her of a, of a not quite so linguistic character, but, but interesting in identity terms, was that she actually took a trip back to Germany, and she found that, you know, she'd been very, very homesick. She very much felt herself a German in the United States. And then when she went back, she found that, she to her native village, she found that everything had been completely Nazified, everything and everyone. They were all spouting the party line constantly. You know, they, there was a, you know, just had been a major adoption of anti-Semitic language, of, of uh, you know, of, of fascist attitudes and so forth and so on. And my mother realized that she didn't belong there anymore. She was no longer a German in America. She was now an American in Germany. And so she went back home to America. But where, where part of America? Detroit, where she was living. Now, Detroit's interesting. Detroit is the only place where you go south, well, outside Alaska, which wasn't part of the US at the time. It's the only place where you go south to get to Canada. Uh, the city of Windsor, Ontario is actually south of Detroit. There's a sort of wraparound loop there where Canada bends down and, and the United States bends up. So, um, so it was very commonplace in those days of, of very open borders to go and, um, to go and uh, do something like cross over into Canada and, and take a picnic lunch and just make a day of it. So my mother got on her bicycle one fine day, uh, you know, after, after she had come back, a couple of years after she'd come back from Germany, she, she pedaled over to Canada, she got her bicycle, and then she heard some people, some Canadians uh, walking by discussing that war had just been declared. And of course, Canada was part of the British Empire, and she realized that she was an enemy alien who's a German citizen in a country at war with Germany, and that she was you know, subject to being interned for the duration of the war. So she hid herself and her bicycle in a drainage ditch until nightfall, sneaked back across the border, which is still open, and, uh, and you know, 
thanked heaven nothing happened from it. In point of fact, Canada didn't intern any Germans who weren't actually spies. Uh, so it, was a, it, it turned out to be a needless worry, but there was no way of knowing that at the time. Now, the story about my father goes to my name. I spent endless time correcting people who mispronounce my name or misspell it. Those who spell it can't pronounce it. Those who pronounce it basically can't spell it. So um, uh, it's C-O-W-A-N. So I, I say, my name is John Cowan. That's C-O-W-A-N. I didn't do that quite at the beginning, but I'm doing it now. Uh, now, how did it get to be pronounced Cowan? Um, as I said, the, it is an Irish name, uh, Mac Owen. And uh, the M sort of fell off a long time ago. And in fact, my grandfather called himself John Cohen. And consequently, my father called himself Tom Cohen until he got into high school. Now, um, because it was such an Irish ghetto, it was pretty much in high school and after that my father started to meet Americans. And one of them was his football coach. So he went out for football in high school. And the coach said, what's your name? And he said, Cohen, sir. And the coach looked at him and said, you're Cowan. And so it was. Now, my father was a raconteur. This story may not be entirely true, but everybody in the family believes it. So the result was that he was, I guess, not the actual, he was like the second oldest kid. But all the others started to be called Cowan, too, and they passed it down to us. So we're all, we're all called Cowan now. And in fact, most of the, the, the fact is that if you go to Ireland and you find people called uh, people with our name spelling, most of them say Kalanaugh as well. Uh, so it's, the, the story is a little dubious, but, but a good story anyway. <laughs>